Good evening, everyone. I hope you're all staying safe and healthy at home. It's Labor Day 2020, and what a Labor Day it's been. Now, for the first time ever, at least in our living memory, um, we're not hearing the voices of the workers, the voices of the masses, as they're out enjoying and celebrating their big annual day off each year. Instead, we're all here collectively um, in the throes of economic limbo due to the global COVID-19 pandemic. So what better opportunity than on Labor Day itself to discuss the regional economy, the direction it's taking, and all the challenges that still lie ahead. Welcome to episode five of The Point. I'm Tamina Kauzji, an independent broadcast journalist, and The Point is my personal talk show where I look at some of the most pressing issues in the news cycle, discussing actionable solutions always with a panel of subject matter experts. Now, when we're speaking about MSMEs or micro and small medium enterprises, did you know that in our region in East Asia, almost 90 over percent of businesses are MSMEs? And as they grapple with COVID-19 um, economic stimulus packages, almost 50 percent of that 90% population is currently at risk over their livelihoods. So that really is the true scope and scale of the impediment that faces all of us right now. But anyhow, the silver lining does arise during such a crisis, and this is looking for some actionable solutions for financing, for kickstarting the economy. For example, access to equitable finance for businesses, for small enterprises, even for the gig economy. So what policies, considerations, and repercussions do we need from governments and institutions at this critical juncture in time? Is it true regional economic cooperation gonna become an actual reality for us in the near future? Well. How about the role of economic superpowers in the region, like China, for example? Together with my panelists, who we take a look at this entire economic situation, um, examining both its causes, um, the weak links, chain reactions, as well as the potential to use this predicament to actually reform and navigate a more sustainable economic path forward. Let's bring in our panelists now. First up, we have Ali Salman. Ali Salman is the CEO with the Institute for Democracy and Economic Affairs, or IDEAS. Now, IDEAS is a Malaysian think tank based in Kuala Lumpur. Ali, welcome to the show. Thank you, Zamina. Great pleasure to jo join you this evening. Thank you. Thanks for being here, especially right after you've broken fast. And we also have uh, Dr. Jessica Wait Ban Yongrat. And Dr. Jessica is an assistant professor of economics at Chula Longkorn University in Thailand. Now, she specializes in labor economics and she's joining us from Thailand. Hello. Hi, Dr. Jessica. Thank you for being on the line. Yeah, thank all you. Right. For Not at all. And now we move into our third panelist, Marco Machis. He is an economist and policy analyst with the Center for Entrepreneurship, SMEs, Regions and Cities, attached with the OECD, or the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. Marco joins us from France. Hi, Marco. Hello, hi. Hi, everyone. Lovely to have you with us here, Marco. So, Marco, of course, it's afternoon for you. It's evening yeah. for the rest of us in this side of the sphere. Now, um, I'd like to start with Marco. So how are things in France currently where you're at? Well, I mean, the, um, sorry to connect uh, a bit uh, later, there were some uh, connection problems, but essentially the situation uh, with the COVID is, uh, is getting better in terms of at least uh, the rate of uh, contagion. Uh, uh, the famous uh, curve is, uh, is, uh, is flattening. And we should uh, finish the lockdown uh, next week on the 11th of May. And uh, there will be a progressive and slow uh, return to, to normal 
That's right. Uh, Marco, I'd also like to ask you about OECD's um, Center for Entrepreneurship, SMEs, Regions and Cities that you're attached with. Tell us about your recent SME policy responses report and the work that this department does. Yeah, essentially, the um, well, OECD, uh, as you may know, it's an organization of uh, 37 member countries, mostly from uh, uh, Europe and uh, uh, North America. Uh, although increasingly it's starting to work also with the Latin American countries and also with the uh, countries in, uh, in, uh, in your region. So, for example, in the context of the uh, Center for Entrepreneurship uh, SME uh, regions and cities, we have conducted uh, um, quite uh, in-depth work on SME policy in Vietnam and in Indonesia. And uh, we do also broader uh, analysis about, about the whole, uh, um, uh, the whole uh, ASEAN uh, macro region. Uh, ASEAN macro, uh, macro region. In terms of our uh, paper on SME policy responses, essentially we have looked at uh, uh, how different countries uh, have tackled uh, the, the, COVID, uh, uh, the COVID crisis. And we see that essentially there are uh, different kinds of response, essentially related to uh, labor response, for example, supporting uh, uh, the payment of wages, um, helping uh, the, uh, the deferral of uh, social security contributions, uh, and so on. So that is a first big, big category, uh, supporting uh, uh, the payment of, uh, uh, of uh, salaries of uh, workers. Uh, tax deferrals is another big uh, area. Uh, so many countries have allowed uh, many countries have allowed businesses to uh, pay uh, taxes uh, uh, later on, so to suspend uh, tax uh, uh, payments, and of course access to credit in terms of uh, uh, loan guarantees, uh, direct credit lines have also played uh, a quite significant uh, uh, role. But we also see that increasingly uh, countries are moving away from simply uh, supporting uh, um, uh, liquidity, so uh, access to uh, credit and loan guarantees, but they're also starting to uh, support uh, the structural transformation of the, uh, of the business, knowing that this crisis uh, might cause and might uh, trigger uh, a totally different way of doing business, you know, like much more uh, business online, for example. So some countries are starting to uh, support the, tr the transition of uh, SMEs, especially small and medium enterprises, uh, into a more digital uh, way of working, uh, supporting, for example, uh, online uh, uh, online e-commerce, uh, broadband, right. broadband subscriptions, and so on. Now, of course, uh, even McKinsey's uh, March report already pointed to the fact that the COVID-19 pandemic is possibly the opportunity that's going to roll by and another one will never come by again to completely restructure the way business is done in essence. From there, moving into um, Dr. Jessica and the situation in Thailand. So uh, on the May, of May 3rd, just two days from now, Thailand will also be partially relaxing their lockdown. Can you share with us what the situation is on the ground with you at home? Yeah, sure. Um, so Thailand is actually, even though it was projected to be the next country after China to have the big um, blow up of uh, the COVID cases, um, mm -hmm. Thailand has actually managed to uh, keep the number of cases uh, fairly low. The number of deaths are fairly uh, low as well. And they've been um, falling um, in, in single digits this last week um, in terms of new cases. Um, I have to credit our uh, very good public health system here in Thailand um, for um, for having this result. Um, of course, we're all nervous that as we um, open up the economy, uh, that we'll see kind of a second round of um, of infections. Um, but at the same time, I think there's this realization that the economy really does need to um, open. Uh, so starting May 3rd, a lot of our, um, you know, smaller restaurants and um, open air um, types of uh, markets um, are going to be uh, open again, uh, which is good because the people who are um, generally selling in these types of uh, shops or own these types of shops are the ones that have been um, most affected by uh, the lockdown uh, measures. And um, so it's uh, quite exciting to see that this is going to be, um, you know, slowly opening up. And uh, I think Thailand has a very good plan in terms of opening up a little, 
waiting 14 days to see if uh, uh, infections will rebound mm -hmm. and then um, progressively opening um, to um, sort of higher risk types of, of venues. Uh, but um, it is sort of a balanced approach, uh, taking into consideration uh, the people that really do need to uh, go back to work and, and don't have um, necessarily social safety nets, uh, but at the same time being cognizant of the fact that uh, we, we need to keep the infections under control. That's right. Now, moving with that gold standard also, I'd like you to just um, share with us a little bit more about labor economics, your field of specialty, and also why it's so important to be able to frame the labor economy perspective for COVID-19 recovery, Dr. Jessica. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm a labor economist. Um, I generally do a lot of work on the supply side. So I think about, um, you know, why people go to work, uh, why they make investments in education, um, and so on. Um, do there's also of course the demand side, which is uh, firms and uh, who they want to hire, um, and so on. And of course, workers are an important part of uh, business, and it's also they're uh, they're not only the suppliers of labor, but they're also the the consumers of products and services that are produced. And so, uh, without thinking about this labor piece, uh, we're think we're not thinking about um, a lot of the economy. And so, having um, making sure that uh, workers are um, healthy, making sure that workers um, can earn money uh, so that they can also spend on uh, services and uh, goods that are being provided is extremely important uh, to think about in the COVID uh, recovery. That's right. Um, and Ali, moving into you next and the situation in Malaysia, your thoughts on the latest government announcement just this morning of opening up um, pretty much all <laughs> sectors come this coming Monday. Yes, um, Tamina, I think the Prime Minister Mohyuddin announcement uh, this morning um, came as a surprise, actually, because um, the earlier announced uh, date of uh, easing of lockdown in Malaysia was, in, in fact, 12th of May. Uh, so Malaysia um, seems to be doing very well in terms of uh, controlling uh, the spread of contagion. Um, also, the number of deaths have reduced uh, considerably. It dropped down to zero in last last week, but then it, it was again reported deaths. Um, so I think this is definitely welcome. And in in the meanwhile, um, Malaysian government has been uh, quite active in uh, announcing, uh, uh, I would say, a series of uh, stimulus packages. They announced uh, three different stimulus packages. And um, I think we'll get more, you know, more time to discuss that. But right now, uh, people are anticipating SMEs, businesses are looking forward uh, to opening up of economic activity, which actually is a far bigger stimulus than any government stimulus can offer. Absolutely. And also, Ali, um, IDEA's recent work also includes ongoing analysis on, of course, the COVID-19 crisis and its impact on Malaysia. What are some of the major takeaways that you are sort of consistently seeing through these reports being produced by IDEA's? So, um, actually, in, in a way, we are pleased to see that uh, one of the major themes uh, which uh, um, IDEA's has been um, recommending in, it was actually a gradual reopening uh, of the economy. Um, what we are say, saying uh, have been saying that uh, this the stimulus package uh, can never be enough. Uh, this this nature of the stimulus package in terms of outreach, their implementation issues, and ultimately uh, it's better for the um, you know Malaysian government to gradually open up the economy. Um, and in the meanwhile, um, I think the lot of emphasis was on um, the in, in, you know increasing the investment in the healthcare, uh, or um, and also making sure that um, if the infection goes up again, then the the, the system should be adequately prepared. And uh, we must commend uh, the Malaysian Ministry of Health in the meanwhile for uh, making adequate arrangements in this time period of six weeks which have spent in, um, in movement control or, or lockdown conditions. Uh, and we hope that um, this time uh, we'll definitely be uh, moving towards normalization, although there will be never probably the same normal that we have seen pre-lockdown. There will be a new normal, as everyone's saying. 
Uh, mm-hmm. But right. um, I think people are gearing up uh, for that now. That's right. Now, from there, uh, moving into Marco. Now, it seems that the general incentive packages for most regional governments in East Asia are quite similar in terms of their tax breaks, um, cash, low interest loans, as well as, you know, loan moratoriums. Now, are these mechanisms enough, though? Um, Apart from their implementation, uh, I'd like your thoughts on the challenges that small businesses will still face given these packages. Well, I mean, yes, essentially, the, it's true. I mean, the measures are, are similar because uh, uh, the crisis is um, what economists would define as a, a symmetric uh, crisis, you know, in the sense that uh, mm-hmm. uh, it hits uh, countries and businesses exactly in the same way with a problem of uh, uh, liquidity, uh, essentially, access to liquidity to pay for, uh, uh, for salaries, for loans, uh, for the mortgage and so on. So that explains why uh, measures are so similar, although there is definitely a lot of uh, credit support. Uh, but as I said, also some countries are starting to uh, introduce uh, policies which favor a more structural transformation of the business uh, uh, using, for example, uh, digital technologies uh, and so on. Uh, or, for example, train workers uh, in new uh, um, in new, in, new, in new functions. Uh, I think other than uh, the, uh, the type of uh, uh, tools, what is important is also uh, the firepower power of the government, uh, which is essentially affected by uh, the tax revenues and by the fiscal deficit. So, of course, uh, it's true that the loan guarantees, uh, credit lines have been the most common way uh, to deal with this uh, uh, crisis. But the extent to which uh, have been implemented, and so uh, that's what I meant by firepower, uh, the extent to which they've been implemented by the different countries has been quite different, depending on the uh, leeway and on the freedom of spending which countries uh, have at the disposal. Uh, and the impact on the, uh, on the businesses so will be different depending on, uh, on, this, uh, uh, on, this, uh, on these measures. Uh, I think for if the crisis doesn't go uh it doesn't protect for too long i think that's the normal and what you would expect from uh, uh most uh governments uh, to do you know it's a liquidity problem so you kind of inject money of course there is a, a room also for a central bank uh, to help by lowering interest rate uh, by eventually uh, introducing uh, uh, quantitative easing uh, uh, instruments uh but essentially uh that are like the sort of uh, uh, measures that you would expect. That's right. Now, um, moving on to Dr. Jessica. Now, in Thailand, what's the scenario for small businesses moving forward from the COVID-19 uh, scenario looking like? And what kind of challenges will they be facing with regards to accessing both finance and also supply and demand? So the um, Bank of Thailand has actually extend or they've come up with a program to um, provide soft loans through the commercial banks. And um, on the face of it, it's actually a, a very nice program. Um, mm-hmm. There's also the um, uh, it, giving some time off from um, payment of loans um, and deferral of interest as well. Um, so this is good for people who have existing loans. Uh, for those who want to take out um, loans um, uh, under the, this new program, the, there are some implementation problems with that um, because uh, it's meant for SMEs, but it's really the M's that are getting it uh, because you mm-hmm. have to have some kind of borrowing history in order to be eligible to take out these current loans. And I know that um, there's some thought that there needs to be some uh, to, to relook at this. Uh, so. Uh, Medium-sized um, enterprises seem like they can access uh, finance that they need um, to move forward, but um, smaller uh, businesses may be having more uh, trouble doing that, and so they're kind of falling through the, the cracks. Um, and of course, uh, they are probably the ones that cannot weather the storm as well as larger firms anyway, because they don't have as much cash on hand. Um, so there is a lot of concern that it's these smaller firms that are going to have to shut down permanently. Um, and so uh, this is something I think the uh, government really needs to look at and, um, and, and work with. Um, 
And but as you said at the very beginning of the show, it's the small firms that are the major employers um, in Southeast Asia, and that is no different uh, here in Thailand. And so I do have concerns if they can't survive, if they can't access the liquidity that they need, uh, that we're going to be um, losing a lot of um, employ, you know, uh, employment opportunities. Um, and so this is something that we need to be concerned about. That's right. And um, Ali, of course, in Malaysia, from the fiscal packages announced and the economic stimulus, only 25 billion ringgit is actually new spending. And also in the past two days, the news that interest may now be charged for high purchase loans and fixed rate Islamic financing during the six month moratorium. Now, how are the MSMEs actually going to be dealing with this in your perspective and what needs to be done to sort of close the gaps? So, so first of all, let, let's let's look at the uh, the you know utilization rate uh, of the stimulus package, um, the the major one, the second stimulus package, um, about uh, sixty billion US dollar, um, uh, you know, um, and sixty uh, percent of that stimulus package was a kind of moratorium on the interest payments, um, and then there are some uh, wage subsidies program. Um, and some other uh, cash assistance program for uh, for uh, you know the smaller size organizations. Now, according to the SME survey, which was released in, in the media a couple of days ago, only 26% of these SMEs um, have actually applied uh, for any of uh, this uh, this this um, package. Now, uh, it could mean number of things. I mean. Uh, for for me, it is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, so uh, you know, because this is really, first of all, uh, the crisis is uh, a demand shock. It is it has become a supply shock eventually. It will become a supply shock. But in its essence, what has happened is a demand shock. So anyone who is in business of selling goods and services. Mm -hmm. Uh, would not be able to see like in next six months any cash flow coming. Mm -hmm. And so whether regardless of whether government is uh, providing uh, help in terms of more loans or liquidity right now at this moment uh, would not be very helpful for that entrepreneur six months down the line if he doesn't see a business activity. And this is especially true for um, some sectors and it's not going to be true for all the sectors. For instance, Tourism in Malaysia, in Thailand, I, I'm sure, and in other countries of the region, uh, any businesses related with tourism uh, are going to take a major hit, and they will unfortunately go out of business. Um, uh, and, and related with tourism, also transport uh, would take uh, you know a major hit. 11% of Malaysia GDP uh, comes from tourism. It is a major source of income for the country. Uh, and that will contribute to the negative uh, growth eventually. Uh, but then these entrepreneurs have also resilience, especially the small scale and MSMEs, MEs, they have re re resilience to go back, to come up again in six months to one year with the new business plan and um, uh, again enter into the business. So I think that is where the government support should come uh, at that point in time. This point in time, that space. Space. Mm -hmm. that's right. It's, it's very difficult even for the government to actually be able to pinpoint whom to help. And also, of course, this the, the, the timing of all this, if you look at the lockdown, uh, first 18 March, two weeks only. So everyone was sort of relaxed. Okay, we can survive two weeks, not an issue at all. Another two weeks come and people were slightly tense. Uh, but still, okay, we can survive. Uh, and then another two weeks come. So these things, uncertainty, uh, cash flow, definitely are adding a lot of worries for these small enterprises. Um, and they would need help. But the point and the timing of the help, uh, I think, is not arrived yet. That's right. Uh, Marco, moving back to you, um, as of course Ali had just mentioned, so these key sectors in the regional economy that have basically been shut down but are big money makers. You've got the tourism, hospitality, FNB, uh, retail, even real estate. Now, um, what will be some of the market impacts, particularly for informal workers, uh, for women? And what's the prognosis and potential opportunities for these sectors moving forward? Yeah. 
No, definitely like the 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 crisis has uh, it uh, stronger like some uh, some sectors uh, as Ali uh, said. I mean, tourism. We see that there is really like uh, uh, idea that um, projections would be that there will not be a return to the pre-crisis levels until uh, uh, 2021, maybe even 2022. Uh, and of course, uh, this has an impact on the economies uh, in, uh, in, uh, in in the Asian region, which are more uh, reliant uh, on tourism. So we see already that uh, uh, the impact of COVID uh, has been much stronger, for example, on Thailand uh, than, for example, on, on Vietnam, uh, which is much more uh, a manufacturing-led uh, economy, uh, which has been able to still uh, 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 continue like the supply of his uh, uh, manufacturing products to, to Europe. Of course, there has been a, a drop in demand in certain sectors, but not in others, in the sense, for example, like everything which has to do with the uh, food, with food, I mean, is still, uh, uh, still going on. Um, we see also that, for example, like Singapore has uh, been hit very heavily uh being like a big uh, trade uh, hub and the logistic uh, hub and a strongly service intensive uh, sector so essentially manufacturing led economies have been able to uh, cope with the crisis a bit better for now uh, of course the longer uh, it gets uh, uh, the worse it will become also for uh, for them uh, in terms of uh, uh, informality, uh, it is uh, an issue. I mean, as you know, like there is, uh, especially in certain countries, uh, the share of informal works is very high. Again, in Vietnam, uh, more than half of the workforce uh, is uh, is informal. Uh, and the problem is that all of these measures that the, the governments are implementing, they're totally missing uh, the informal workers. You know, like in order to have uh, uh, for companies, uh, uh, when companies receive uh, a subsidy uh, for the wages. Uh, it means that the employee, the, the employee is a, a formal employee, is not an informal uh, worker. So I think uh, if you wish, like, and I get back to your previous question, if what is missing is really like a strong intervention in the informal sector. Uh, Throw, for example, uh, uh, universal cash transfer scheme. Uh, that there should be much more in place, uh, including, of course, in the, uh, in the Asian region. And we have not seen so much uh, yet. There is something, but uh, in a scale which is not... Uh, yet uh, uh, adequate. Mm. Dr. Jessica, of course, moving on the same topics to you and Thailand. Now, Thailand, of course, huge, huge tourism industry, almost 40 million odd um, tourist arrivals in 2019. How is this going to be impacting um, the tourism sector, particularly those who are mostly informal workers and vulnerable as well, the women? Yes. Um, yeah. Tourism makes up about 13% of our GDP. And so it's a, it's a very large uh, part of our economy. And um, of course, it was um, the earliest and um, hardest hit and will probably um, be the hardest hit for over the, the long run here. Um, the it is a largely um, informal. Uh, oh, we got some notes. OK. <laughs> um, so uh, I have a, a few statistics here. We have about 37.8 million people in the labor force. And as of February 2020, we have an unemployment rate of 1.1%. So these numbers come right before um, sort of COVID um, really uh, wreaked havoc on uh, the economy. Um, and we were already having problems at the end of 2019 because of, of the strong bot. Uh, so tourism was already struggling. Manufacturing was already struggling. Uh, we had also a drought. Um, so agriculture has been struggling this last year as well. And um, those three sectors together actually make up of almost 57% of our labor force. And um, in the informal labor force is over half. So it's about 55 to 65%, depending on how you um, define it. Um, and so a lot of these informal workers are actually um, uh, employed in these particular sectors, in particular accommodation and, and food service. Um, and so there's two things uh, that are of concern here. They're not only informal, but there's also a large um, group of migrant workers that work in these industries as well and have, um, even if they are kind of covered by social security and so on, um, they don't have jobs to go back to. And that's another issue that we need to uh, kind of deal with. Um, just 
a little bit more about who was being affected or impacted. Um, in general, uh, we think there's about uh, about five to seven million people that were impacted by the lockdown measures um, directly. And um, there's this nice uh, table here. This is from uh, one of my colleagues, uh, uh, current uh, it just just come out paper this last week. Um, and uh, uh, what they did is they actually analyzed occupations uh, based on their physical proximity to others. So if you have to work closely to, to others um, or whether you can space yourselves out and then also location flexibility. So can you work from home or do you need to go into the office or the factory to work? And the red quadrant, uh, these are occupations that are uh, going to be highly affected by lockdown measures. These are the first jobs that would be restricted and probably Probably the last jobs to be um, to, to be reinstated, and you can see in here tour guide, uh, travel organizer. These are are um, in the red zone and um, were um, very impacted um, not only by the lockdown measures, but then also from the the demand side as well. Um, and um, I mean, nobody's coming to Thailand, um, uh, even without the travel restrictions, uh, we saw lots of uh, cancellations. Uh, but what I, um, in the next slide, what I want to um, show here is that uh, the impacts of the lockdown restrictions um, have not been uh, distributed evenly across the entire economy. Um, so we have the wage quantiles on the vertical axis, and you can see that the uh, bottom three um, quantiles have the largest proportion of workers uh, that are in that red exactly. category. That's right. And so they're very um, uh, negatively mm -hmm. affected by all this. That's right. I think that just uh, in a nutshell, it really displays who's most vulnerable and why, just because of the nature of their jobs itself. Now, from there, moving into um, Ali. And now speaking about the banking and finance sector, which has a massive role to play in dictating the future of um, the economy from both the private as well as the central banking perspectives, what do you believe are some um, immediate or necessary measures that can be considered for reinvigorating the economy, uh, Malaysia-centric, of course, if you will. So, I am, uh, as I as I said earlier, um, I think uh, the uh, financial uh, relief was actually the most uh, important part of the stimulus package, uh, which the Malaysian government has announced. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the bulk of the financial relief actually is uh, supposed to, you know, supposed to come from the banking sector which the government has announced already. Um, and, uh, uh, but what has happened in last uh, couple of days, um, uh, and I think it points out to also a legal vacuum. Uh, mm -hmm. So what happened in last couple of days is announcement from the banks. Uh, they were saying, they are now saying that look, um, a six month down the line, you still have to pay. And uh, that has, uh, sent a that very wrong uh, shock waves across uh, uh, borrowers. You know, Malaysia has one of the highest um, uh, debt levels um, in the business, but also at the household level, about 85 to 90 percent of GDP. Um, and, and of course, businesses also depend on uh, these loan facilities, which because they're out of business, out of business activity, are not able to service. Uh, so this was supposed to be a part of the plan, but um, since this has not been legislated, uh, there is no uh, the banks are not legally obliged to follow um, the announcement. It seems uh, so that has raised uh, you know that has um, uh, you know raised a lot of question marks on the uh, sustainability of the scheme. So I hope that the Malaysian government uh, comes very soon with another explanation that how they're going to help uh, in terms of the cash flow. Um, so right now, this was the major, and uh, as I said, uh, benefit, but that has put under a question mark now. That's right. Uh, Mark, I'm moving back to you. Um, let's take a look now into the fintech arena and the potential for it. Uh, how big of a role could its mass integration potentially play for East Asia, similar to how um, China is doing with regards to injecting capital for businesses? But of course, the scenario and landscape in East Asia is not quite as established as it is in China. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Tanina. Essentially, uh... 
I will be a bit more uh, pessimistic on this in the sense that uh, uh, we see that uh, in the example of China, even on China, uh, alternative finance uh, uh, accounts for about 0.37% uh, of national GDP, uh, so loans through alternative uh, uh, finance. Whereas uh, uh, traditional banking uh, uh, represents the, the amount of uh, uh, traditional loans is uh, uh, to SMEs uh, account for like more than 50% of GDP. So, I mean, we're really talking about uh, two different uh, weights, you know, as if comparing uh, lightweight with the heavyweight in boxing. So, they're really like two mm -hmm. uh, different things. This is not to say that uh, it's not important, of course, it's in the headlines. But in the uh, foreseeable future, I still see uh, the role of uh, uh, traditional banks and uh, collateral-based uh, uh, lending still uh, predominant with all its uh, uh, shortcomings uh, and, uh, and problems. Nonetheless, I mean, fintech clearly uh, has potential in many areas. Um, for example, uh, even in some of the areas where you can actually integrate the work of uh, uh, banks. Uh, for example, some countries, and here I move out uh, of the uh, Asian regions, like in Brazil, uh, we did a study and we saw, for example, that um, they created like a, a, a demand and supply in traditional banking. So essentially the company will go on the platform, it will uh, submit his uh, request, laterals in terms of like, for example, uh, uh, revenue flow and so on. And uh, on the other side, there would be banks which might show interest. They would be registered in the in the in the in the platform, and they would show interest in giving credit to these companies. So I think that you are not necessarily uh, uh, um, sort of alternative, but they can actually integrate very well uh, their their role. And then there is also a role in fintech for financial education, for example, which can also again uh, um, increase. Uh, financial education increase like uh, understanding of uh, uh, loan application process or uh, understanding of uh, uh, consumer loans as well I mean without uh, necessarily focusing only on uh, business uh, rural areas for example and again they can have, they can have a, a, a multiplying effect uh, into uh, access to again a traditional source of finance so uh, it is important uh, but it's not gonna uh, uh, replace uh, traditional banking, I think, at least not in the uh, in the short term. Right. Interesting you should say that. Dr. Jessica, do you share Marco's uh, fair bit of pessimism surrounding the role of fintech in post-COVID recovery? Or do you have other ideas? Yeah, I, I agree, in the, at least over um, all of the roles of traditional banking. Um, but I do see a lot of opportunity for the rollout of more um, fintech in itself. Uh, Thailand has um, uh, one of the highest rates of uh, penetration of um, cell phone um, use, um, in, uh, fairly well uh, connected. And uh, mm -hmm. But that infrastructure okay. has not actually been um, utilized so much for uh, fintech. Uh, we do have some uh, pay um, using a phone number, um, and it was thought that that was going to really take off and that was going to uh, be um, sort of the wave of the future for doing uh, payments and so on. Um, and maybe that that uh, it, it's happened, but um, other um, types of um, uh, uh, bank based um, transfer systems have also um, uh, uh, been developed over the last couple of years. Um, in terms of the response of the government um, to program uh, to transfer cash sector uh, that was directly impacted by um, the COVID crisis um, called wasn't just this really direct way people at the banks trying to um, you know okay. open bank accounts and, and transfer uh, very you know quick cash out to um, everybody um, who needed it uh, rather than this very in the lockdowns um, Ali. I would like to ask you about fintech as a microfinance vehicle and the opportunity for that in Malaysia currently, especially with our... I may not be able to share the sort of uh, latest uh, statistics uh, on um, on this. But I can uh, say with some degree of certainty that um, mm -hmm. the Bank Negara had been trying uh, to, to move to a cashless system for a number of years. Uh, it introduced... Uh, uh, what is called payment uh, reform network, um, 
but it is still an ongoing process. There has been some success. All right, understood. Now, moving in from there into the question of ASEAN. Now, of course, even with the launch of the official ASEAN economic community back in 2015, uh, Marco, there still seem to be plenty of barriers to entry between markets. How crucial will the integration of the regional economy be to post-COVID-19 recovery? And will regional governments be able to seize the day, so to speak, rather than still be stuck within that pre-COVID paradigm? Yeah, I mean, you are right. Essentially, we again, I mean, we 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 have statistics in the uh, in UCD that uh, uh, look at uh, uh, what we call the FDI, for example, FDI restrictiveness. So, how much countries uh, uh, are restrictive of uh, foreign direct investment, and uh, uh, basically, all countries have. Uh, higher rates than the OCD uh, average, which is maybe not so much surprising. But in some cases, the, the, the size of the gap is really uh, uh, significant. Uh, in particular, like the Philippines and Indonesia are still very close uh, uh, compared, for example, to uh, Cambodia uh, or, or, or Malaysia. So even within um, uh, the, the same region, of course, there are strong differences or of course, Singapore, which is a bit of a, uh, an outlier. Uh, so, and the tariff rates as well. I mean, in terms of tariff rates, uh, again, uh, uh, trade barriers will uh, go down in the uh, ASEAN regions. If anything, because we are seeing uh, a withdrawal from uh, uh, global supply chains to more regional supply chains. Uh, this was already ongoing uh, due to the uh, China and United States. So it's something that uh, predates uh, COVID, but with COVID, uh, uh, let's say the problem is getting uh, uh, more accentuated. Uh, there has been a bit of a, a backlash, at least within uh, here in Europe, uh, with the fact that um, uh, for many many weeks there were no uh, masks, uh, there were no like public has come to realize how much uh, here in Europe we depend on like these like very long uh, supply chains that can be disrupted at a moment of crisis with the huge impacts on public health. So I think we are moving towards more regional supply chains, which of course means that uh, uh, in each region of the world, including of course in Southeast Asia, uh, government should really try to uh, coordinate and work uh, more closely together um, uh, to, 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 to open uh, uh, borders to trade and to uh, foreign investment, which at the end of the day, of course, it's a key driver of uh, uh, growth as we've seen over the last decades. That's right. Dr. Jessica, I wanted to ask you on that note, when it comes to protectionism, uh, particularly with regards to, let's say, the agriculture sector or even tax free movement, all of these are easy concepts to talk about, but very difficult to actually enact on the ground. Uh, looking at the Thailand perspective, how can um, risk be minimized to key core markets while also at the same time embracing um, the value of free market movement for post-COVID recovery? And this is a little bit kind of outside of my, um, um, and so I, I'd actually like, can I um, actually talk about the, uh, sure. the ASEAN um, 2015 free flow of, of uh, labor? So, I mean, part of this uh, economic community um, agreement was that there would be this free flow of labor across all of the ASEAN um, uh, countries. And, uh, but the, this free flow of labor was very limited to um, mm -hmm. uh, skilled labor, such as engineers, doctors, uh, nurses, um, accountants, and so on. And um, and I've done some uh, a bit of work on this. And the thing is, is that if people want to move, uh, that came out of the 2015 um, AEC um, community. Um, what we're really missing is actually agreements on lower skilled labor. Uh, so countries have bilateral um, um, MOUs, uh, but it would be nice to see if we could uh, open it up and have more free, la uh, uh, free movement of lower skilled labor across the ASEAN region to be able to fill um, uh, demand in, for, you know, in Thailand's case, we have a lot of demand in things like manufacturing and in agriculture that we can't um, fulfill. Um, that may be changing now that uh, the economy is contracting a bit, but um, I think that's what would be helpful is to allow for this free, free flow um, of labor so that we can fill in um, uh, where we do have, uh, where we still have demand. 
That's right. Now, uh, that perfectly segues into my um, next area of discussion on uh, the foreign labor dilemma in a post-COVID economy. Uh, Ali, I wanted to ask for your perspectives on the fact that, of course, with the economy shrinking and job losses looming on the horizon, how is uh, the Malaysian economy also going to be impacted by the fact that cheap labor out of uh, Indonesia, Myanmar, uh, perhaps even Philippines in some cases in some sectors is not going to be as freely available? For the recovery sector yeah i think this is very important uh, before i come to the labor aspect uh, just let let me add a little bit on the earlier discussion on the asean sure. and the uh, free trade uh, ideas actually has been uh, publishing an asean uh, prosperity scorecard for last uh, couple of years in which we have That's right. actually looked at the implementation status of the aec um, uh, agreement uh, since uh, 2015 uh, and, um, you know, they, there has been a lot of progress uh, on the implementation of uh, uh, the regional trade. Uh, and as we know, as far as the, uh, the tariffs are concerned, um, close to 99% products, there are no tariffs. So effectively, in that sense, uh, you can say it's a pretty much free trade area. But then increasingly, we see a lot and lot of uh, non-tariff barriers. Um, which the countries are imposing. And that is actually uh, now, I think, restricting uh, the flow of the goods on already. On the, on the flow of the labor, uh, uh, my impression is that uh, when this crisis hit, uh, of course, it was not anticipated. Uh, no one has um, anticipated it. And so uh, that meant that also with the travel ban uh, immediately imposed once that uh, crisis was realized, um, the labor, the informal labor, let's say in Malaysia, uh, of course was sort of out of job and is out of job as we speak. But um, they're not going to go back in large numbers. They have not gone back out of the country in large numbers. Uh, there were trends uh, like Malaysia was actually like gradually moving towards like lesser dependence on the foreign labor before the crisis. So um, uh, th this crisis may actually uh, further that trend, but it's not going to be a drastic change. So what, um, so I think my, 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 my guess is that um, within the few months of the, uh, you know, normalization, that labor would be reabsorbed back into the uh, the activities like construction, like agriculture. Although Malaysian government and uh, many experts have been saying that we need to move away from the dependence on foreign labor and move towards more automation, but uh, but that will take a lot of time. So I think after uh, after like temporary unemployment, we will see reemployment in most of the cases. Um, uh, because uh, for employers, it, it is very difficult to sort of, uh, you know, rehire, are heavy costs of rehiring them. And the government is imposing more and more restrictions on that. So um, certainly in the short term, it is a crisis, but I think in six months to one year, uh, we will see them back. Right. Marco, um, I wanted to ask you about your perspective on the role of women entrepreneurs and informal workers in propelling the post-COVID-19 economy in East Asia, um, all the way from social cohesion to creating the, uh, recreating sectors in the economy and even family life. Yeah. Yeah, um, if I can, uh, yes, I mean, informal workers of, as well, but uh, if I can touch just uh, quickly on the previous point, I think uh, yeah, sure. uh, we, May see also, I mean, I totally agree uh, with what uh, uh, Mr. Ali said, uh, but in the short term, again, there would be eventually like a, a drop in remittances, uh, which have become like a big part uh, of, the, of the economy in some of these countries like Indonesia or the Philippines, uh, which may have a deterioration in terms of like a currency depreciation and essentially on the cost of borrowing. So I think it's totally true. I mean, these people will go back to work, I mean, uh, in six, 12 months. But in the very short term, it might also have a macroeconomic impact on the fiscal balance uh, of the uh, sending country. Uh, in terms of the role of uh, uh, informality, I think it is, uh, they again, they, they play a very important role. Um, the idea, I mean, is, is that they should, uh, I mean, the more they are integrated, as I said before, no, they are basically excluded from like the uh, support measures that we have uh, discussed before. So, 
uh, they have the harder ones that are hit uh, the hardest uh, by this uh, this crisis and hence the importance of uh, uh, trying to reach to, the, to these people through universal cash transfer which i was mentioning uh, uh, before uh, and in the long run to to, to make reforms uh, business environment reforms uh, that can support the formalization of the business uh, i don't see informal workers are like key drivers of the post-COVID recovery, you know, they are like the most vulnerable uh, workers. Uh, so if anything, um, I think it's an occasion for uh, an awakening call uh, for many countries in the region to introduce the needed reforms uh, to make uh, easier to hire and fire and to uh, therefore reduce the size of informality in, uh, in, uh, in, the, in the labor force. Right. Uh, Dr. Jessica, I'll move with that question into you. Uh, the role of uh, women entrepreneurs and informal workers also in propelling um, Thailand's post-COVID-19 economy, particularly with regards to not just the um, dollar value they bring of their work, but also social cohesion, family life, everything which has also been um, disrupted and taken on a very different form currently. Sure. Uh, Thailand is quite interesting. Well, I think a lot of uh, Southeast mm -hmm. Asia is quite interesting in the fact that women play such a strong role in, um, as economic contributors. Um, it certainly has historically been the case uh, for Thailand. Um, and in fact, in the past, they were the, um, in many cases, were the primary um, economic contributors. And um, that sort of waned over the 20th century. But then, um, especially in recent years, with the rise of manufacturing and uh, um, increases in education, women have um, really participated in the labor force in um, larger numbers um, and all across the spectrum. So from uh, sort of the most vulnerable um, informal workers all the way to um, the, the highest paid um, uh, formal workers. Um, uh, the research so far that's coming out says that women, especially low-income women, have been the most impacted by um, COVID so far and the COVID-related uh, lockdowns. And so as um, the uh, lockdowns are lifted, um, women are the uh, 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 many of the people going to be involved in reopening these uh, small enterprises and, and businesses. Um, and so they're very important in that sense. Um, however, they're also very involved in the tourism industry. And so there is going to be a large group of women, both formal and informal, that uh, may be uh, left without work for um, longer term. Um, and of course, those who are formally employed will be uh, uh, should be covered by some sort of social protection through the social security program. But those who are in the informal sector, um, again, many who are in uh, tourism um, are in are informally employed may not be um, covered. And so um, it is important that somehow we get help to these um, individuals. Uh, they are the ones that are also consuming um, items and creating demand in the economy as well. Um, and um, in terms of social cohesion and so on, I think uh, globally we've been seeing that women's work has been coming to the fore um, in, in these lockdown. And, um, uh, you know, women are, are involved in homeschooling um, children. They are involved in um, home production that may have been done outside uh, before. And um, so women are um, often um, burdened with a lot um, of a lot more responsibilities in this type of situation. And we need to make sure that women are supported um, in both their economic roles as well as their care roles. Absolutely. And also with um, ASEAN's uh, population being about roughly 50 odd percent uh, female, 50.2 percent, um, that definitely speaks to the fact that women need to be not just better protected, but better rewarded for their economic as well as social contributions. From there, I'd like to move on uh, very quickly into a generalized um, question for all three of you about your perspectives on China's role come post-COVID recovery, particularly with regards to the fact that China already does have a fairly strong presence in Southeast Asia. Um, Ali, your thoughts on this? Uh, well, China and, and, and Malaysia and with other South Asian, uh, Southeast Asian countries, a uh, major trade partner, major uh, investor in, in the in infrastructure. So, and uh, a couple of years ago, at the time uh, at the time of the government change in Malaysia, there was like a temporary suspension of some of these transactions, but uh, there were 
then they were normalized. So we are back into the business with, with China. And, um, and it's good to see that China has already uh, recovered uh, from the pandemic uh, crisis. Uh, and it seems that it has effectively controlled and contained the, uh, the, the pandemic uh, you know, in the Wuhan province. province. And uh, it's coming back to the economic activity. It's certainly uh, good news for, for not only Malaysia, but for the region, uh, broadly speaking. And I guess that it is important uh, to uh, to emphasize that uh, while these trade relations and investment relations uh, are, are very, very important, actually, we are doing a study which uh, sort of compares uh, the regimes of investments uh, coming from China and different countries of the region. Also, I wish to emphasize that, uh, uh, you know, it is important to for these countries, for the, uh, the, the receiving countries, to ensure transparent mechanism of managing these investments uh, from China so that there is no uh, pressure on the national governance uh, system and procurement system. That's right. Uh, Marco, your thoughts on uh, will China be able to economically uh, and indirectly wield an even bigger influence sociopolitically in the region post-COVID? Yes, I think it will uh, continue the trend. You know, there is the, the big uh, Belt and Road Initiative and the ASEAN countries are big uh, uh, recipient of the uh, BRI. And so there is a lot of investment uh, in terms of infrastructure, but also other sorts of investment uh, uh, in these countries. In addition, we have to add the fact that uh, because of uh, increased uh, uh, increasing uh, labor costs in China, other countries are starting to receive, such as Vietnam, of course, uh, are starting to receive uh, uh, a lot of investment uh, uh, from uh, European or uh, from European countries or from the United States. So some of the production that used to be in China is moving. Uh, uh, to other uh, lower cost uh, uh, countries. Uh, so I think the role is going to be uh, important, but also the other way around. You know, there are like still, uh, for example, Malaysia is a big uh, uh, exporter of uh, microchip, microchip uh, and electronics to uh, China. So it's not just one way, you know, I mean, it's a very uh, integrated economy. Uh, and so, yes, the role will, uh, will increase, but there are opportunities. A very important trade partner uh, with Thailand, and I see that continuing um, in the future. Um, I, and I agree with Marco that it, it goes both ways. It's not um, just uh, one sided. Yeah. Um, one thing, though, that I think has come up um, in, mm -hmm. uh, in chats with other economists um, is we want to make sure that the investments that are coming in do have um, benefits for Thailand. So, for example, if we only give tax breaks and then um, everything, you know, if it's a new firm that and everything's automated and there's no real um, local employment. Exactly. Um, then we need to think about that and think about um, making sure that the um, uh, that we're, we're both benefiting from these arrangements. That's right. Okay, so from here we move on into um, a couple of questions that we have from the viewers who have been joining us on this live stream. Thank you so much for your perspective so far. It's been uh, really very interesting to delve a little bit deeper into not just the very macro perspective with Marco, but also Malaysia-centric and um, Thailand-centric opinions with Ali and Dr. Jessica. Let's bring on the first question now. Uh, this one comes from Nukman Hakim, and he says, are there efforts on legislating new policies to combat market manipulation at the micro SME level and SME level, especially for essential goods for the survival of the COVID crisis? So this is one that um, all of you can actually address if you've got something to share. Well, um, if I could just add uh, briefly on that from a, a Malaysian uh, perspective. Sure. Uh, as I said actually a, a, a earlier in, um, in a response that, uh, you know, currently the parliament um, in Malaysia is, is not in session. And it, even if it will go in session, it will go in session only for a day because of the domestic political situation. So we will anticipate, uh, uh, we will not anticipate any new legislation, uh, but the government has already imposed um, price control, which is usually it does in the fasting months and during the Raya, the, the Eid, uh, the celebration uh, season, uh, as far as the control of the commodities or the price is concerned. Um, though I, as an economist, I'm not in favor of price control. I think they are harmful for uh, both consumers and producers. All right, thanks for that, Ali. Um, Marco, Dr. Jessica? 
Yes, essentially, in, in the EU, for example, in Italy as well, there are like some uh, talks about uh, uh, basically some sort of like price control, for example, in terms of masks. But I must say also because I, there have been, uh, unfortunately, it's a disgrace, but there have been cases of uh, fraud. Uh, the price of masks in some cases uh, at the peak of the crisis has gone up to six euros. Which basically make it uh, yeah, it's it's a lot, <laughs> and uh, it makes it uh, not accessible. You know that these masks are not uh, you, you you need like uh, if you go out two or three per day. Uh, so spending uh, twenty euros just to go out of your house uh, it's not acceptable uh, either. And uh, and so yes, there have been uh, uh, talks of introducing uh, some sort of press controls on key. Uh, items and at the same time there has been a huge uh, effort uh, to tackle essentially these uh, uh, these frauds that uh, at this point of uh, uh, crisis and emergencies uh, unfortunately uh, often happens and uh, and so there has been a lot of prevention and uh, and uh, and control for example again on the quality of uh, uh, masks ventilators and the other uh, key public health uh, items. Dr. Jessica, what's uh, how about Thailand-wise? Anything in this arena? Yeah, um, actually, one of the things that's been really interesting um, mm -hmm. is that there's been a real effort to keep supply chains open and running. And so the government's actually been very active in making sure that's the case. And uh, mm -hmm. so. Is, uh, you know, the hoarding that we've been seeing, um, hoarding of toilet paper in America. We, exactly. We're not seeing um, that kind of thing um, here as much. I mean, there, there's been days when everybody's been at the grocery store, but everything gets seems to get stocked again. So I haven't seen, um, you know, price gouging I um, for the most part. Now, masks, uh, again, I think everybody has had the same problem there. Um, and um, I'm not aware of exactly which measures the government has um, implemented um, having to do with PPE, but um, my guess is that they are definitely involved there. That's right. So we actually have um, quite a lot of questions. Let's bring on um, a few of them and let's see whether we've got more opinions to share on those. Uh, Marcela Suazo asks, how are women going to be affected differently? Most of them are in services and informal economies. And what lessons learned do they have on successful policies to create uh, temporary safety nets, particularly for women, as well as for aging women who still provide for themselves? Dr. Jessica, if you could perhaps take this one. Sure. Um, in the Thai case, women are much more likely to be working in jobs that require close contact uh, with individuals and also um, working outside of the home. So uh, women are going to be disproportionate disproportionately um, impacted by lockdown measures and then also by the reopening measures as well, having to invest more in uh, PPE um, and uh, making sure that, you know, customers and so on are also you know, following rules and so on. Um, and so this is, uh, so we know this, that women have been disproportionately impacted by these lockdown measures because men, they may be more like, likely to work as like a mechanic, for example, and uh, that can be done without having to interact uh, very closely uh, with um, other people. And so this is something that um, I think the government needs to think a bit more about and the fact that they are going to be more directly affected. Um, in terms of uh, the lessons learned on providing um, uh, you know, assistance during this time. Um, I think that we've learned that when you say, please sign up if you're having financial difficulty, um, especially online, uh, is going to be uh, not the best way to reach the people who really um, need right. it. And um, that we need to think about using universal measures. And um, certainly in the case of, of Thailand, um, we already have several universal programs. We have universal health. Um, in terms of the older people um, that was just asked about, we have a universal pension program already. So um, the government already can get funding out to uh, people on a universal basis or um, roughly what the, uh, the informal economy is based on who's eligible for universal health. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, in the future that this is probably where the government needs to know to make sure that nobody is left behind. 
That's right. Now, of course, uh, I, I love that you brought up the fact that it's not easy accessibility for everyone. Um, in Malaysia, similarly, there have been huge issues with the indigenous communities or the Orang Asli accessing the government relief and the aid because they're simply not online. They can't fill up those forms online. Uh, we've got um, two more questions. Um, let's bring on another one first. Uh, Turesh Jude asks, will there be a change in the way governments and big business look at the economy given its susceptibility to pandemics such as this? Uh, Marco, if you could key in. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just one, uh, I will answer this question, but one uh, point on, uh, uh, the, on, the, on the previous question is that we don't have sure. to forget that uh, uh, women are the majority of uh, uh, care workers. Uh, nurses and uh, people working in uh, uh, in hospitals nice. as the, uh, or like in in care houses, uh, and so actually they've been uh, hit by the crisis by the COVID crisis uh, disproportionately. Uh, it is good that it appears to be that uh, they are less uh, likely to uh, develop like serious the serious form of COVID, but uh, because of like the um, uh, sector distribution of the uh, female labor force. They've been uh, highly exposed to this uh, uh, to the crisis. Uh, so, just to uh, to to add a point on on the previous, I think it was uh, it was important um, concerning like the, the the so would there be a change in the way governments and big business look at the go at the economy? Given as yeah, I think it is uh, it is the case. I mean, as I said before, uh, there might be uh, a reluctance. Uh, and a withdrawal from like big supply chains, big and, and long supply chains. Uh, they might go more like for uh, regional supply chains or domestic supply chain, at least as I mentioned, uh, for the key uh, items uh, related to uh, public health. So of course it's a, uh, it's a critical time when uh, uh, it's an opportunity for governments uh, to reconsider uh, the way they've been doing things until uh, uh, now. Uh, again, it also depends uh, on the duration of the uh, of the crisis, on uh, uh, what kind of life is uh, waiting for us uh, when the lockdown will be uh, lifted, uh, and how long it will take before we, we can come back to the previous normal, which essentially depends uh, on funding a vaccine or funding a treatment uh, for uh, for COVID. So it is a possibility. Uh, but it really depends also on the length uh, of uh, uh, the COVID crisis. That's right. Ali, do you have uh, anything to key in, either for this question or even the one before? Um, maybe on this question. Um, sure. Uh, I think this 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 crisis uh, will will definitely uh, you know uh, force the government and businesses to to rethink some of their strategies. Uh, but I, I see uh, marginal adjustments. Uh, I do not see uh, a major restructuring of any kind. Um, I think the you know the, the it is important that uh, of course as a part of the globalization we are living in and the supply chains have become important integral part. Um, so there will be some adjustment, let's say in terms of necessary items like food items or health related items, which are more prone to crisis, but in terms of um, the durable goods, um, you know, which, which we use in our lives or automotives, I, I do not see uh, that being affected. So I, I see uh, this crisis would lead to marginal adjustments in, in the business strategy and the government strategy as well. That's right. Okay, from there, we've got one last question for all the panelists. Let's bring that last one in. Eric Ho asks, how long would we need to see positive recovery from the current negative climate for Malaysia or the region in general? Also, what steps or framework does the region need to take? Dr. Jessica, perhaps? I think um, in the case of Thailand, because we're so dependent on tourism, I think it's going to take uh, well, both manufacturing and tourism. So uh, mm. it's going to take basically the time uh, for the global economy to uh, recover enough uh, to be able to stimulate demand uh, for our products again. 
but then also the um, lifting of travel restrictions and uh, uh, and then also again the recovery of demand for um, international tourism. So it's going to be a bit of a long slog, I think, for the Thai case. It could be um, up to maybe a couple of years even. Ali, what about the Malaysian perspective? Before before this crisis hit us, the the projected growth rate for Malaysia was in the range of like four or four to five percent, four point five percent, and the recovery is expected uh, somewhere in 2021, and that is assuming that uh, we are already entering into a resumption of economic activity and we don't go into another lockdown or a series of lockdown, which is very much possible. Right. So uh, we might see this coming back. And in that case, uh, the recovery will take even longer. Otherwise, we have started uh, Malaysia um, as an economy has already entered into the recovery phase um, with the partial lockdown lifted a couple of weeks ago. And uh, from next week on, 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 major parts of the economy will be back on track. So we will see that happening very soon. But as I said, some sectors would take much longer to come back to new normal. That's right. And Marco, for an uh, overarching OECD perspective on how long a positive recovery may take. Yeah, it's uh, centering in line with what uh, uh, Jessica and uh, Ali said. Uh, it will take a, probably uh, 2021 to, uh, and again, it depends on uh, uh, the different variables that uh, uh, have been mentioned, you know, whether there would be other uh, outbreak of COVID uh, in uh, what in Europe is uh, uh, fall. Uh, so like in September, October, which is the typical season when uh, you develop and you have like the flu. And so if this virus comes back, of course, uh, and if we go back into another uh, lockdown, uh, the actual recovery might uh, uh, might take uh, uh, much longer. But also, as I said, the new normal, because for example, even if you go back, uh, let's say to normal life, but if you need to apply social distancing, uh, effectively, social distancing means a lower demand. So imagine, for example, if in restaurants you have to sit uh, two meters away from each other, of course, there would be a lower attendance and therefore like lower demand. And the same thing in shops, if you need to line up uh, to try your new clothes, you probably won't uh, be willing to do it like every weekend, you know, like you will go and uh, you will buy much less probably. So again, um, social distancing may uh, mean also uh, just in general uh, uh, lower demand. And of course, uh, lockdown, if there is another lockdown, it might mean uh, again an increase in temporary unemployment. And so and this might uh, uh, delay eventually the recovery. But for now, the current uh, uh, estimates are uh, beginning of 2021 if there is no other lockdown. Right. Thank you so much for all of that. Uh, now, we've actually got two more questions, but as we're running short of time, we're just going to tease the audience as well as the panelists by just displaying them across the screen and take that away as food for thought. Let's bring them on. Uh, Kek Wei Chuan asks, do you see Vietnam rising as a rival to China politically, militarily, and economically? All right, interesting perspective there, given how they've been handling COVID-19 fairly successfully. And Nukuman Hakim asks, Will we be looking towards a petroleum recycling system since there's eroding trust in the petrodollar system? Right. Very interesting. Speaking of, you know, um, the global climate itself and who knows where things go. But before I let you all go, if I could just have you summarize in one short sentence or perhaps just even three words, each one of you individually, what advice would you give to entrepreneurs, businesses and even governments out there. Uh, Marco. Yeah, I mean, just one short sentence. I think it's uh, this is a liquidity problem. So essentially, my main message would be to try and keep uh, a viable business alive. Uh, most of the new most of the businesses, uh, they were in the market, so they were alive. They were they didn't have any structural problem. So I think in the short term, it's important uh, uh, to make an effort uh, to keep this business alive uh in the economy because uh ec the economy is uh sticky as we say like uh, as economists say and uh, things don't change it rapidly so once a business is gone it's gone for good with jobs skills business networks and so on thank you marco um dr jessica i just have three words uh persistence resilience and creativity 
well summed up. And Ali, from your perspective. I think this crisis does provide uh, some opportunity to rethink some of the business models. Um, some businesses would, uh, would not see um, coming back. Um, so they need to definitely come up with new business models. But frankly, I, I, I am confident that the entrepreneurs uh, have the capacity to come back and start new businesses if they are pushed away. That's right. Thank you so much for that, Ali. Um, thank you all. We will remove you out of the broadcast studio view for now, but uh, we request for you to stay in the background so that we can get back to a quick debriefing chat right after I wrap up the show. Thank you so much. All your perspectives have been absolutely invaluable. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ali. Well, so in a nutshell, uh, SMEs, MSMEs, they have borne the weight of the coronavirus outbreak, particularly with regards to the economic impact and also especially in East Asian countries in our region. So as countries in the region move towards easing out of COVID-19 lockdowns, there is of course nothing more important than getting the economy back into gear. But at the same time, as Nobel Prize winner Joseph Stilgit's recent piece on struggling in a good economy, now struggling in a crisis observed, even before COVID-19, a lot of people were living at the edge and you have an event like this that pushes them over. Thus, from our perspective here on The Point, governments need to step up and perform to minimize this inevitability by strengthening social protection, um, job security, and sustainability in these challenging moments. This should be a key part of the larger micromanagement of the economy, supporting SMEs, MSMEs, as well to save jobs and offering solutions, not just empty solidarity. Our thanks go out once again to our stellar panelists from Ideas Malaysia, Chulalongkorn University in Thailand, and also, of course, the OECD. Thank you for watching this special episode of The Point on Labor Day 2020. I'm Tamina Kausji, and it's been an absolute pleasure. And until next time, stay safe, stay home, and stay informed.